Anyway, the first of all, how I learned past, present, and future is the title. And I'm a paleontologist, so I'm interested in that. What's going on at the moment, which is really quite interesting, we have efforts to try and save birds and um, prevent more extinctions that have taken place. Mm -hmm. And certainly the future, because Lord Howe Island is undergoing a massive rat eradication program. There's 50 eradicators, mainly from New Zealand, who were set up there in June, July, August, and they're going to blitz the island. I'll tell you more about that later. Anyway, Lord Howe Island. Okay, right out here, it's Sydney's here. So you fly from London, Sydney, and then to Lord Howe Island. It's about 436 miles east and northeast of Sydney. Really remote. It's about 7 million years old. It's part of a fragment of, of this huge ridge here. This is the Lord Howe Ridge. And its closest island neighbour is Norfolk Island. And I'll just mention Norfolk Island now, just so you know and you're aware. And then you've got New Caledonia up here, New Zealand down here. So it's pretty much here in the Tasman Sea. In the South Pacific, quite a remote place, ideal place for birds to reach and do their thing evolutionary wise. It's um, quite a small island, it's um, 10 kilometers, about 6 miles long, about 0.2 to 0.3 kilometers, so it's less than half a mile wide in, in various places. And imagine that this is really uninhabited because it's all mountainous, there are tracks and trails that do run around here. And the second area is really this little piece of land here. And this is where all the agriculture takes place, the town, the small town, and uh, all of the tourists and so on. And the way of getting round is there are cars to hire, but very few of them. So there's a big bike hire industry. So you hire a bike and you work your way around. So it's quite easy to get around. Very attractive place to live. And. Uh, is started. As you see, it's quite mountainous on either end. This is a settlement area, and uh, these are sort of lower mountains, but they are palm rich, palm dominated, and really beautiful forest here. And then there's some really lovely forests, of course, on the, on the two mountains as well. But this is sort of heavily developed in this area, as you can imagine, being a settlement area. And uh, the two mountains. This is Richbird and this is Gower, Mount Gower. Gower's up here somewhere. Every, every day you get a good view of the cloud formations over these two mountains. So when you come up, the first thing you'll do is take a photograph. We've got a whole series of boring photographs of cloud change over time, but it's great. So Mount Gower is the tallest mountain, the highest mountain on Lord Howe, and Lichbird. And this is a view from the second area, touristy beaches and things like that. Well, Lord Howe is really quite interesting because it was one of the last islands to be discovered by Europeans, which is really quite remarkable. And it happened by HMS Supply, it was a ship they were taking, they were setting up a penal colony on Norfolk Island, if you remember from that slide, way out. It was far enough out to take the worst criminals, and there was no way they could escape. So the supply was going from Sydney to Norfolk and supplying the penal colony. And Henry Lichbird Ball, Lichbird, that mountain is named after him, on the return, spotted Lord Howe on the way out, and on the return journey stopped and claimed it for a Britain. So that's Lord Howe discovered. And really remarkable as well, the Polynesians really got everywhere, got to New Zealand, they got to Norfolk Island, mysteriously disappeared from Norfolk Island about 500 years ago, no one knows why. They missed Lord Howe Island, they never actually got there. So when the Europeans first landed, very fortunately, it was a pristine island. Now, think of the name Ball. There's a very famous spot uh, off this. There's, there's the two mountains there of Lord Howe, and this is Ball's Pyramid. And some of you may be aware that David Apple did a program recently that um, the Lord Howe chicken insect, Lord Howe Phasmid, hanging on on, this little, on a few little scraps of vegetation on Ball's Pyramid because rats have wiped them out on the mainland of Lord Howe. So it's a big campaign to get them in captivity, breed up the numbers, and there's now plans, if the rat eradication project is successful, they'll be put back on the island. But would you believe there's opposition? And I'll tell you more about that later. Well, I'm, I'm an artist by, 
really by training, and that's my first love. So I'm always interested in the arty side of things. And quite amazingly, there was, as the penal colony was being set up, there was um, convict artists who were really, really good artists. And one was Arthur Bell Smith, and he left some wonderful illustrations. And so as he sailed past this, his Balls Pyramid, he did this wonderful, this Gower, this Lynchbird, and the island of Lord Howe. So he did his lovely little sketch of the place in 1788. And also, very interestingly for me, he did the first illustration of the Lord Howe Gallery, which is an extinct world, which I'll talk about in a minute. But just know that he was very observant because you have an all white one here, and then these two have got patches of blue on it, which has caused a bit of confusion in the past, to saying, well, what was he doing with the were they multicoloured, were they all white, and so on. And I did a study on them a couple of years ago with a colleague, my Van Grau, and we found some very interesting things. Also in terms of art, this was recently unearthed. It's actually a slice of whalebone, and one of the convict artists illustrated the whaling sperm whale. You see by the square nose in here, that's Paul's Pyramid. So he was on shore, and here's the ships doing their whaling thing. And the thing is, they, they were stopping at Lord Howe Island for only two years, so 1788 to 1790, just that two year period, ships stopped going there in terms of the penal colony on North and so on. And so it became really a whaling station stop off, stop over. The sailors come ashore, they catch birds, get fresh water, and they had time to do these little sketches while they're whaling offshore. So from 1791 to 1834, when the first true settlement took place, it's very sketchy, we're not really sure what's going on, there's very little actually recorded. But one thing was certain in that time was the this Lord Howe Gallinule, this uh, very quite mysterious bird, actually became extinct. And the reasons being is that it was practically flightless and it seems to have been restricted to the lowlands, so it's very easy to catch. And um, when the, the first reports about the ornithology came out, this bird was no longer mentioned, so it disappeared probably within a decade after 1780, or something like that. And we mentioned those white and blue birds. There's two skins. This is the Vienna skin, and it's pure white, and most people think, oh, it's an albino, but it's no such thing. It's actually a, a mutation called progressive grain. So as the birds get older, they start getting more and more white feathers, and in, in the final, in absolute maturity, they can turn completely white. It's so much like gentlemen, ladies getting into their mature years, years they start losing the colour. These birds are doing the same, but they retain the natural colours of the legs, feel and eyes. So they didn't have red eyes and not that normal colour. And it's a recessive gene, and it must have been in that population on Lord Howe Island for this to occur. Very interesting indeed. And George Raper was another convict artist and very observant because they, they have nothing else to do but sit there and paint while they're waiting to go on to Norfolk Island for the penal colony. And here he's done a, a white one and a blue one, an all blue, so it must be a young bird and a chick. And progressive grain starts, so the first plumage would be blue and then gradually they start changing to white. But how do we know that? It's because there's a second specimen in Liverpool. And as you can see, this one is not quite the same stage as the Vienna specimen, it's still got patches of blue in it, and it's not quite there, so not quite as old as the Vienna bird. And I did a reconstruction based on these colours, because there was a genetic study done in Charlotte. <coughs> the Lord Howe Gallinule actually is genetically distinct from many other populations, so and it's quite basal in the clay, so it's a, a, a very ancient bird, and by matching those colours visible on this specimen, I was able to reconstruct it. And this coloration is unique in these Porfirio gallinules. So there's no other gallinule with that coloration. So it's really quite an isolated population. As far as we know, Norfolk Island, not in recent years, ever had a gallinule, which is quite bizarre, but it's so much further to the east, maybe they never got there. All the Polynesians may have wiped them out that time they um, stayed on the island. Well, it was, um, the first ornithological survey was done by physician who stopped off John, he was there for about eight months, John Folius, and um, the settlement had been there since 1834. In 1848 he did a survey, Lord Howe Gamley was gone, that was extinct. But just about everything else we know that's there was there when he, when he recorded. 
in two, including two important species. I'll go on to them now. And this is one. This is another George Raper painting, and another artist as well. And uh, there was this pigeon in huge abundance. And Folis was saying that uh, it was the only thing worth staying on the island for, catching as many pigeons as you want. They're so tame, just whack them on the head. You only have to use your firearms, you know. And they were just loading up these birds. <laughs> And um, we know from the coloration that it's a Vigiens, a club of Vigiens, it's got its own subspecific name. Uh, nothing else is known about it, no physical evidence at all. And so I was quite interested to find any bones of that one. It'd be nice to see what its relationship to it. Was it big? These paintings, there's no scale bars, you've no idea, you know. These, these, there's a number of subspecies of the club of Vigiens throughout the city. Some of them are really big and some are smaller, so it'd be nice to really work that one out. Anyway, after Fogus' visit, in, um, about 20 years later, uh, that pigeon disappeared. Settlers really took it out. And sadly, there was a, a distinct sub, uh, species of Cyanoramphus parakeet, the kakariki, and uh, it was shot because it was a pest of the settlers' crops, orchards, and so on. And they just shot it out of existence. Luckily, two skins were collected, and they're a tree, they're unique. But again, that's it. There are two skins, nothing else known about it. So there's another one I was hoping to be able to find. Lord Hell then had a respite. So from the 1860s, when this one disappeared, everything seemed to be calm, collected. All the birds were in there, doing their thing in the forest. Other um, ornithologists were coming in, describing them, saying how common they were. And then a second disaster hit the island, and it's absolutely hideous what happened next. And the culprit was this beast here, and it's the black rat. And it's one of those times when the exact day of arrival was known. Because what happened was, this is a photograph of the actual ship. This is the SS Macambo, supply ship to Lord Howe Island. It came too close, this is Ned's beach, it came too close here and there's this tip of this rock here, it actually hit this rock here and, and got um, marooned, it didn't sink, it was actually wedged on its side like this and so they couldn't get it off the rock so what they had to do was they had to take all the cargo off by a boat and they put all the cargo ashore to Ned's beach just here, refloated it, repaired it and then took all the cargo back and then went on their way. And in that time, when they bring all the cargo ashore, there were black rats in the cargo and they escaped and got onto Lord Howe. Well, you can imagine, there were Lord Howe Island, like many of these islands, are dominated by birds, flightless birds and so on. The one reason why they're there, usually, is because there's no terrestrial mammalian carnivores. So they have the islands themselves, they can involve flightlessness, they involve all sorts of different traits. If you've got a predatory mammal there, very, very rarely happens unless the island's big enough, something like Tasmania, where you've got the flightless native hen, but the island's so big it was able to become flightless still, even though there's lots of predators. And uh, if anyone doesn't believe, and a lot of the islanders don't, that black rats don't do anything, don't do any harm to birds. I mean, this is some um, shots in, in New Zealand, and it just hideous, they just take out kill every egg, destroy every egg, take chicks, they take adults, especially passerine birds, songbirds in particular. The black rats are incredibly good climbers, they're incre incredibly aggressive, and if the going is good and there's a lot of food available, they explode in numbers. And that's exactly what happened Lord Howard. So within a two year period, and just in case some of you can't read it at the back, I see it at the back, a local resident, Alan McCulloch, um, was there, and he, he wrote about the wonder, wonders of the birds and so on. And uh, this is his quote, he said, within two years this paradise of birds has become a wilderness, and the quietness of death reigns where all was melody. The very few birds remaining are unable to breed, being either destroyed upon their nest or driven from them by the rats, and their eggs eaten. One can scarcely imagine a greater calamity in the bird world than this tragedy which has overtaken the avifauna of Lord Howe Island. And he wrote that in 1920, two years after the rats got on the island. And the casualties, very sadly, were 
Lord Howe Starling, now this was very common, in, uh, it was actually encouraged to come into people's gardens. And uh, this is a painting from Pinewood, 1940. But uh, this is my illustration of the skins. And uh, the Lord Howe one was actually the larger one. And that's the Norfolk one. And sadly, the Norfolk Island uh, Starling is also extinct. And um, they disappeared very quickly because they were very tame. And they nested quite low down on the ground, uh, in trees, but very low down. So they went out followed by the Lord Howe thrush. Now, the island thrush, there's a huge number of subspecies throughout the Pacific, and um, they're inherently tame, just like a lot of island birds. And there was, there was um, a guy from Hull, who went there in 1909, said of them, he said, they peck around the gardens, just like blackbirds in Britain, and he said, they even flip over the cow pads. Cows are still an important part of Lord Howe. There's a lot of cattle breeding for the milk, cheese, and so on. And he said they would flip over the cow pads to get the insects and grubs and things from the cow pads, you know. Anyway, two years they're gone as well. And this is particularly sad because it was a really specialised white eye, um, quite a large one. It was called the Big Grinnell by the locals. And uh, it was notorious for attacking the other birds' nests and puncturing their eggs and ruining their eggs by drinking the yolk and something like that. But um, they were in prestigious numbers and they just disappeared so fast. It was so they're particularly vulnerable, which white eyes can be. And it's this one here, the Lord Howe Fantail. That was another one, sadly, great in the rats. And finally, the Lord Howe Jerry Gold was the full species, and uh, that too has come to rapidation. It's very sad to think. Well, the islanders thinking, well, we've got to hit back at this. We, all these rats were suddenly a major problem. The houses are everywhere. Um, Big palm industry, uh, industry on Lord Howe, it came to your palms, lots of different palms, it's now died, but North Island has taken over the lead role in that. But in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, it was the main economic uh, system for providing financial uh, funds to Lord Howell and the Islanders for selling the palm seeds to various companies around the world. So what they did was they brought in owls, um, barn owl, marsh owl from Australia, release them thinking that would cure the rat problem. Well, they, they were of course taking rats and that sort of thing, no problem at all. But what they didn't realise at the time is that they had an endemic owl on Lord Howe Island, Lord Howe Bubuk, and up to the, um, these owls were actually taking rats as well, but once the much bigger marsh owl, barn owl that came in, they took out this owl, they competed it with for nesting cavities, and then there was a sort of increase in deforestation. All those factors combined to uh, make it extinct. The date given is 1940, it was probably uh, 10 years before that that it disappeared, and so that is now totally extinct. So it's quite a sad tale, which it Lord Howard. There is some good news, not all sad to do. <laughs> well, I am um, sorry this one's out of this was supposed to be a bit of film. And um, it, it, for some reason it didn't work. But anyway, that's me finding fossils in a cave on Lord Howe Island, just showing that I wasn't there just sunning myself and having cocktails. I was actually <laughs> doing some work. <laughs> and um, we went to, there's about seven, seven good caves there, quite difficult to get in, limestone caves, perfect for fossil preservation. And we did find bone material in every one of them, but always seabird, which any seabird specialist out there, fantastic, you'd be skipping down the street. But for me, I was really interested in terrestrial birds because that's where the unknowns are. And sadly, you didn't find anything terrestrial in those caves. So I was a bit disappointed, really. But so after we'd done the cave work, we went to the Lord Howe Island Board, which is administered by New South Wales. And basically, they're rangers, and very attractive rangers as well, by that. Um, they're rangers who take, uh, look, look after sea, um, sea turtles, and monitor bird protection, petrels, and so on. And so they're based there for nine months of the year, and there's a changeover, and you start coming. And I was talking to this lady about, oh, you know, did we really find anything? And she said, well, I found a skull of a bird on the beach. So I said, oh, can I have a skull? That'd be great. Can I have a look? And, there's quite a few seabirds still there, there's dead bodies around and stuff, so I thought it might just be a seabird. And then she waved this at me, 
thing. But actually, that's the pelvis, the Lord Howe Gallagher. And it's, this bird was unknown in the fossil record. And she'd go, yeah, and she had it on top of her computer. And she went, what about this? And I mean, passed out, you know. So that's me rejoicing at the fact that it's um, the first fossil specimen of a bird from Lord, Lord Howe Island. So uh, I said, where do you get it from? She told me, got it from a place called Blinky Beach. So, Blinky Beach, the airstrip ends here, and Blinky Beach runs off here, so it's totally out of bounds to um, tourists, locals, and everything. It's all, but we got permission to go there. And the problem is, this is incredible, they have a small plane, it's a 22 seat, no, 32 seat comes in, and the June keeps building up so that it's a ridge like that. And just that metre ridge means they have to have one passenger less on the plane because of the weight and the distance that has to come. So they keep taking it down so they can put one more passenger on the plane to make more money. And I thought it was a joke, but that's absolutely true. So they purely go there and they clear down this dune to allow one more passenger on the plane. When they're clearing it away, first thing I was interested in, these are terrestrial snails. Some of these are extinct. And there's a little bits of bone here. They thought, oh, this is really interesting. So we full permission, and then once hunting around, if you get your eye in, which I, sadly I do quite often, um, this is the tarsal of tarsal. It's the ankle bone of the Lord Howe Gallagher, just laying on the sand that's been eroded out. And there was huge numbers of bones, and we picked about 700 bones, um, of which over 50% were terrestrial birds. So we've launched a fossil record now for all those species, which for me was just fantastic. And uh, some of the other nices, well, I mentioned the Lord Howe parakeet, so two skins, and um, this pair of humeri, the ar upper arm bones, and these are probably associated with probably the same bird. And already I've had people, um, can we have these for our data set? We need, to, can we take DNA and so on? I'm like, oh, they're, not, they're still on Lord Howe Island, they haven't got them off the island yet. And I've had requests for the use of, because they're so rare. That's a real bonus. And, Lo and behold, our friend, the Lord Howe Gallinule, this is what we ended up collecting. That piece of bone that I showed you in here is that one I was just showing you on the in situ on the sand. That's there. We found a complete one. Toe bones, the tibia, the femur, and there's that pelvis that the girl was shown waving at me. And for me, looking at this, these bones are incredibly robust. They're really powerful, which shows that this bird was almost certainly flightless. And what happens with flightless birds is they get an equivalent build-up of big pelvis and massive limb bones because they're now running around on the ground rather than flying about. So very important, and we're writing up this stuff, the new description of this bird, from the inside out, if you like. And also, we can't go away without saying about that Lord Howe pigeon. Um, only known for those two paintings, and we collected about 120 bones on it. Um, just for example here, there's nine the humeri. And uh, these are going to make an amazing study. So really, really pleased. This bird now has got physical remains at last, and we've got lots and lots of material. So that was just a fantastic success. So for my part, great. And then this last one I'll show you. These, these islanders, this island syndrome, is really quite bizarre. And they were saying the buff banded rail now is everywhere on Lord Howe. Everywhere you go, you see it running around. And they fly. They're quite wary. So to me, get, I really had to be careful to get a shot like that without it pulled, flew off. And they're saying, these birds are coming, they're a pest, they, they peck around their gardens, they, they do all these things, they, you know, terrible things like being alive and stuff like that. <laughs> and um, in that same deposit, which is an old deposit, there's the upper bill of the buff band ground. It was there long before any people were. So I said, well, I've got evidence for it. And the, oh, no, you must be misidentified. No. That's Buff Banded Rail, okay. So Buff Banded Rail, and there's um, the Lord Howe Gallinule. So Lord Howe Gallinule's gone, Buff Banded Rail is coming back. Whether this original one was a distinct a species or not, I don't know, because we need more material. But then there's one more rail to talk about, which uh, just excited me beyond belief. Didn't come out a well, when you deal with these paleo records, I'm not, there's no more bones, people, so if you fill up the bones, that's it. <laughs> Um, there's some extraordinary things going on on this island. There's this wonderful forest, and I'm actually, by coincidence, I'm not going to brag it, but I'm off to Hawaii on Sunday for four weeks 
because I'm working on this massive project on extinct frugivores. So in other words, birds that eat fruit, large <coughs> fruit, that have become extinct. What is replacing them? Are the exotic animals coming in actually doing the job of those extinct birds? Or are the trees, shrubs, whichever produce fruit, are in absolutely dire straits, there's nothing dispersing their seeds and fruits anymore. So and we're looking at all these different groups, Hawaiian Islands, Mass Greens, Mauritius and so on, Madagascar, New Zealand and so on, and doing a big comparative paper. It's going to be a really nice job. So when I was there, I was looking, and um, it's a calliphory, and it's actually where the fruit is produced very low down on the trunks of trees. And that is a signal that is usually in association with uh, on Mauritius, for example, with lots of trees have that, for giant tortoises or flightless birds. So the dodo will take a partridge because it's been pecking distance. So the fruit is really low down, not at the ends of the tree where you imagine it to be. So in order for the flightless or big lizards and so on to actually be able to disperse the fruit. Lots of trees of this. And huge abundance of very brightly coloured fruits as well, which is another sign of something there was dispersing this fruit. And what it was, well, was it a bird? In fact, there was a discovery, and the school material coming out now, uh, Myelania is um, this bizarre horned giant tortoise, and it's, um, it's been found in Australia, it's been found in New Caledonia, and bizarrely it was on Lord Howard as well. It died out about uh, 15,000 years ago, but they, they found a complete specimen of it, and how it got there, probably drifted across, floated across, which tortoises are very good at doing, was that the animal dispersing all those fruits, or are we still waiting to find some big flightless bird? I'm hoping for the latter, of course, you know. So, questions already, what was going on, what was dispersing those fruits, and that just, the trees are happily producing, but they're just dropping at the base of the tree. Right, this is a moment of truth. I just thought, visually and sound, just give you an idea of Lord Howard, if ever you were thinking of going there. And this is this wonderful, open palm forest, very rich in palms, there's 12 species, there's also lots of figs and all other stuff, so this is the team, of look at Ian Hutton's a very, um, he's called Mr. Lord Howe, he's the Lord Howe Birdman, and these two guys with his uh, two cavers who originally found those caves, and they came along to, to assist me. And I mentioned um, flightless birds, and this actually is the very first, my very first wild flightless bird, the Lord Howe hen, wood hen, and uh, it's an incredible bird, it's really big, and it can actually survive rats, and that's why it's still with us. You can imagine flightless birds normally, if it was something small would be taken out by rats, no problem. But then cats got established, uh, people drew introduced them to, to take out rats, and they took out the wood hens very, very quickly. So they were hanging on, on just one place, Mount Gower, on the very, very top, and uh, it's a real hike to get up there, but it's really worth it because when you're up there and after the exhausting climb, we stop to eat our sandwiches and um, it's so hard, you're not supposed to, to accidentally drop a crumb of bread <laughs> to bring one round to your feet. And there it is there. And uh, they, they just, you can make any noise, I'm, I hope you get the sound, um, the, Videos going for you. You can make any noise, and they come over. They're so inquisitive. So then, it was just fantastic to be up there on top of Mount Gower with that. Um, but a real hard climb. Completely fearless. This is the first time I saw it. I just like could hardly hold my hand steady enough to. Uh, amazing. <laughs> seem to attract them. <laughs> this is looking from the top of Mount Gower. That's a midge bird. It's like this tiny little plateau up there. And this bird here is the coral, Lord Howard coral. It's an endemic. It's really big. It's not this big. And if they're nesting, they, they just go for you. They actually attack you. They make this really sharp bill. Um, but out of breeding, which luckily we were there when it was out of breeding, they just follow along behind you. So as you're walking along, they're just hopping. And every time you turn around, it's just here, hopping along. It's incredible. 
And uh, it's, it's such a fantastic oh, it's so, uh, it's it's literally off the side of the rail, and uh, then have my chance to see this one just sort of following me around everywhere. It's quite a lot. Look how cool. It's that time. That's where the sounds are there, but it gives you an idea of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> some non-endemics as well, um, um, which are beautiful birds, um, strictly restricted to forests, and the emerald dove is one, and you hear them cooing. Um, when Colop said that the forest was silent, they're actually quite noisy now, and that's it's a shame we can't get the sound going on that, but um, there are really lots of sod birds singing, um, but some very recognisable birds as well, which you'll see in a minute. Um, and these are the surviving ones, and amazingly, the big grinnell, that big, very specialist white eye disappeared. But, um, but this one, the smaller one, survives, it's plentiful, and you see them everywhere hopping about, you know, um, which is really nice to see. So I'm not sure why this one survived, the other one disappeared, but maybe it was more of a generalist, it nested in better situations than the, the endemic one. I'm not, this is an endemic, but um, I'm still not certain why it survived, but it's with us, very, very important. And then there's uh, another endemic. And this one, well, it's a beautiful <coughs> colour, this bright yellow, the black and white. It's really difficult to see, it hides deep in the forest, and it's got a really loud call, the song, and you can hear it all the time, but you can never doubt want to see it, because I've pinched it on the internet, sorry, for this image, but um, I, I've got some little yellow flashes where I'm trying to photograph, but um, very nice indeed. It, it certainly makes it a cheerful place. And then there's the same kingfisher, which is nice. And this, sits on the beaches, on the rocks on the beach, on the shoreline, so it's very easy to photograph, it's a little piece of wood on the beach, and um, it's also in the forest, but that's another nice bird to see as well. So, some have come through and survived, but the rail of Karawong, there's various passerines and some other birds, so it's not all completely doom and gloom. And one of the other interesting things about it is you think um, Norfolk Island and Lord Howe, they, they kind of got some connection in terms of bird fauna, but what it turns out to be is that Lord Howe Island, the birds, the bulk of the birds, are derived from New Caledonia. So this has got to be due to you know, lower sea levels and probably island popping and so on. And that Norfolk Island, the birds are derived from New Zealand. So you've got that effect and that effect for the two different islands, which is really quite strange. Uh, but that's it, that's, that's where the origins lie. So, in terms of biogeography, very interesting indeed. If we find anything new, it could be more interesting through the fossil record as well. Well, I wasn't there for seabirds. I thought I'd throw a few in, in case of seabird specialists there as well. Providence petrel only breeds on Lord Howe Island. Um, real problems with rats, but also, and David Attenborough and his programs, which I'll come to in a minute, um, announced the plastic problem even hitting far distant Lord Howe Island. And uh, Alex Bond, who's the creator of Natural History of Tree, is um, actually doing a project he was there last week in fact, studying these petrels and the problems with plastic. Kermadec uh, petrel um, only br breeds on Borg's Pyramid, believe it or not, not on the main island. So you can see them flying around the coast and so on, but they actually only breed on Borg's Pyramid, not on the main island. Don't be because of rats. And I could have strangled this bird a thousand times over the mutton bird, flesh from the sheer water. It, um, everyone's houses, any bit of ground at all, it makes a burrow, and of course they come back at night and they just make this incredible loud gabbling noise all night long. And we couldn't sleep, it was so loud, just in the end. And we'd go out there and try and shoot them off, and they'd come back again and make this incredibly loud noise. And it went on for three days solid, and then swoop, and they're gone. And we never heard them again for the rest of the trip. So we must have caught just the tail end of them being on the island. But huge numbers, but again, they suffer from rat predation. And there's a colony of masks for booby as well, and they have a viewing platform. And this is the breeding colony, you actually stand on the viewing platform and look down, and 
watch the birds with the egg, the chicks and so on, and coming into the evening and so on, it's really nice thing. They've got a very large population of uh, red-tailed tropical bird as well. And that's a very aggressive species that seems to be able to withstand rats pretty well. Well, I mentioned the, uh, uh, the problem with plastic, uh, which we'll see in the next slide, but um, they are protected, and it's wonderful to see. It's a 10 mile an hour speed limit. We still have signs that mutton birds on road, woodlings on road, and you've got to be careful not to ride, them on your, ride over them on your push bike. And there we have mutton bird on the road, just as it said on the sign. So that was their line but they, they are well protected, but it's the, the dangers within, unfortunately, that, that have taken them out. This is part of Alex Bond's study, and um, he's finding these birds and all of this plastic inside one bird, and then it's just a disaster at the moment. You know, and, um, if the campaign to clear up the seas and that, that hopefully will be in time to benefit seabirds like this, and it's not just on Northern Ireland, of course, it's across the globe. Any bird, marine birds are in danger of having this condition. Well, the final part I'd like to talk to you about is this rat eradication program. And it's it's a massive because it's the one of the largest islands they're going to attempt to completely rid of rats within a six-month period. So they've got the same these 50 guys coming in, guys and girls coming in to do this program. And what they do is they bake these these um, buckets. They're taking up the helicopter and they're just dropping every 10 meters rat bait. And they're going to completely start, and they're doing this over the whole island. Around the settlement area, they're physically going to go under houses and just completely blip the island with bait. It's all been tested, it's been tried and tested. It, there may be one or two casualties, but in general, birds don't touch it. And they're aiming at the black rat and they're aiming at the house house, which was introduced about 1840 when the first settlement, first settlement was set up. So um, that's the aim, and they start next month, and they're going to run it for three months, and then hopefully rid the island of rats. That's the plan. Now you think that'd be a great thing, you know, but just to idea what the rats can do, um, I found these great photographs. These are, these are from pre-rat days, this is 1915, and um, there's Mount Gower in the background, so this is a second area, and it's just alive with seabirds, you know, which is phenomenal. And uh, very importantly at the time, um, mutton bird flesh was a, a local delicacy, they exported it as well, so the lads would go out and collect mutton birds in the breeding season and so on. Huge numbers, didn't have much impact. And I've got another film here. This is the best colony they got of this is such a turn. Can you hear it? Just about hear it. Yeah. And you saw that photograph with an air full of them, it's not a patch on what it was. But it's a breeding colony. So there are numbers of seabirds, but the Nowhere near as they were pretty back days, you know. Set the idea. And they, they nest all over these big rocky cliffs and things, you see birds here nesting. I didn't want to go too far without disturbing them, but um, they weren't very happy to be being this close. So, imagine um, completely rats have done in all those birds. They've um, taken out stick insects, taken out land snails, they're a pest. And this I just downloaded from a report where they interviewed, and this guy um, I was actually with him for a little bit of time, and he said, um, um, that bring back the stick insect, just for example. It infests houses, it eats crops. It's a nuisance, it's ugly, so it shouldn't come back to the mainland. You know, this is an endemic stick insect that once was on Lord Howe long before this guy was on there, and unfortunately he's got quite a bit of influence. And um, he was telling me that uh, the 
this rat, rat, rat eradication program is absolutely outrageous. He said, rats don't do any harm to the birds, there's no evidence for it. And he said, our woods and forests are full of birds. And he said, um, just look over there now, so I'll just show you these couple of examples of the birds they're full of. That's your Eurasian song thrush, and that's your Eurasian blackbird. You know, they, yeah, they, they know how to avoid rats, all right, and they why they do very, very well. And so he was absolutely opposed to rat eradication, as quite a few of the islanders are. And so they initially said, we're not going to allow poisons anywhere near our house. Um, but it's now a law, and they're coming in, regardless of when they fight and scream or whatever, they're going to blitz the island with poison. So it's that kind of island mentality that you have to overcome, which seems bizarre, but in his mind, these birds have been around, rats have been there, so what's the problem? You know, it's only when you look at the past, which he obviously wasn't doing, that issue exists. And one point that I thought was very good was that one guy in particular was concerned about was that rats control mice. So a black rat control them at the mouse, house mouse contained to the settlement area. If rats go, then mice have the island to themselves. We can end up with the Goth Island, in, which is a complete disaster, where the mice, have, I don't even heard of the term carnivorous, and they're taking out thousands and thousands of <coughs> chicks. They just, um, they didn't know why the, the death rate was so high. Well, they set up cameras, nocturnal cameras. The mice are eating them alive. They just come out of their swarms. And they usually enter from the rear end, go inside, and just kill them overnight by eating them alive. Terrible. And their big concern is if they don't manage to get rid of all the mice, they do the rats, are we going to end up in a situation like this, which is a good point. So the key thing is they have to make sure they get everything. And that's what they're aiming to do. And I've got to finish just quickly with this. Um, a fry-up. Great. Great British fry-up. Um, if anyone's thinking of going, brace yourself for the costs. <laughs> uh, just to give you an idea, my flight from London to Sydney was £740. The two, uh, hour and a half flight from Sydney to Lord Howe was 640 So nearly the same as the international flight. And it's a very unreliable surface depending on weather and so on. And then everything has got a 20% subsidy because um, import duty tax on it because it has to be brought in for the mainland. There's a tourist extra rate as well. And so after we've been on there a week, there's on Sunday we'd had enough of bread and stuff like that. We decided we were going to go to this one place open and they did a big fry up. So three of us, we had a big fry up, double coffees and whatever, and it come to a hundred. 40 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and when it came out, I was like, oh my god, unbelievable. So uh, it, it's a great place to go, but it is really, really expensive. Uh, but I think the expense is worth it, absolutely. And it is a World Heritage site as well. So if they can get rid of the rats and get rid of the mice, once again, Lord Howe could return to something as it once was. And they're talking now that if they do, if they are successful with the rat eradication, and the mouse radiation, they may bring back some of those extinct, close to extinct species. They're actually eradicating the owls, there's about 20 left apparently, and they're taking those out. Cats are banned now on the island, the feral population's gone, and they're thinking about bringing back side of the how to keep the Lord Howe pigeon, because there are other some closely related subspecies elsewhere, and they could really bring back Lord Howe to where it once was. And very fortunately, a lot of the forest is still there as well, that has remained because of the high peaks of Mount Gower, Mount Vigeburn and so on. So I've just got one more bit of film, and this is, uh, sorry, the next one. And it's um, hiking up to Mount Gower, which you've got to do if you go there, it's, it's a hard work, but I'm halfway up here, and you just, it's just the most spectacular, when you're high up, it's harder to see over the island because of the forest. Halfway up, you get this beautiful view. And you come here, around here, and there's a rope, and you hang on to the drop, sheer drop. <laughs> and that's a settlement area, and there's a far end of the mountains, you know, so it's just spectacular. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention.